Today, the high frequency trading's arms race and why you cannot win. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Back in 2015, the Bank of England published a research paper examining how high-frequency trading impacts market efficiency. High-frequency trading, or HFT, is where automated computer traders interact at lightning-fast speed with electronic trading platforms for profit. HFT has become an important feature of many modern financial markets, such that the rapid growth and increased prominence of these ultra-fast traders have given rise to concerns regarding their impact on market quality and market stability. These concerns have been fuelled by instances of severe and short-lived market crashes, such as the 6th of May 2010 flash crash in the US markets. One concern about HFT is that owing to the high rate at which HFT firms submit orders and exchange trades, the algorithms they use could interact with others in unpredictable ways, and in particular, in ways that could momentarily cause price pressures and price dislocations in financial markets. The bank used a large set of data on individual high-frequency traders to examine the interactions between different HFTs and the impact of such interactions on price discovery. And they showed HFT firms tend more than their peer investment banks to buy or sell aggressively the same stock at the same time. Also, a typical HFT firm tends to simultaneously aggressively buy and sell multiple stocks at the same time to a larger extent than a typical investment bank. Now, the author Michael Lewis published Flash Boys, a book in which he claimed that the US market has been rigged by HFC to the point where ordinary investors are always behind the market and will miss out consistently. Flash Boys also suggested that there is a problem in the US with unnecessary intermediation and limited transparency via so-called dark pools that it is to the detriment of investors. Indeed, dark pools and HFT are closely linked. In fact, high-frequency trading is an arms race in the quest for speed. Anything to get a millisecond advantage. As a result, it creates an ever more uneven playing field. For example, in 2010, the spread networks completed a fiber optic cable linking two key trading hubs, Chicago and New Jersey, where Wall Street has its computerized trading equipment. That cable cost 300 million US dollars and took the most direct route between those two points and shaved more than a millisecond from what had formerly been the shortest round-trip travel time for information at 14.5 milliseconds. That tiny time saving was a boon for the high-frequency financial traders who could take advantage of it to buy or sell before others learned of distant price shifts. This general strategy, called latency arbitrage, has driven a technological arms race in the trading world, with companies competing fiercely to send information from one trading centre to another in the minimum possible time. Companies such as Mackay Brothers built special microwave links between these two same trading centres. Electromagnetic waves travel much faster through air than glass, so with the help of properly engineered radio equipment, microwave signals can readily be light in glass fibre. A similar battle appears to be taking now across the Atlantic, 
where information to guide lucrative trades traditionally flowed through fiber optic submarine cables. In 2015, Hiberia Networks, which was later acquired by GTT together with TE Subcom, completed a 4,600 kilometer fiber optic cable that followed a specially direct route between New York and London to offer the least delay requiring only 59 milliseconds for a signal to make the round trip. Hibernia expected that its cable would service high-frequency traders with the fastest possible connections between the two cities. But now, as reported this week, some HFT traders are experimenting with radio rather than fibre optics between these two centres to gain even greater speed and so that split-second advantage. Zero Hedge highlighted last year, firmers will go to great lengths for just a few milliseconds advantage. It makes a difference between billions in profits and losses. So here is another example. An empty field in Aurora, Chicago was bought for $14 million, which is twice the growing rate for a 31-acre plot of flat, undeveloped land. And a mysterious antenna, a single nondescript pole with two antennas, has been erected by a row of shrubs. And the owner is not a developer, but Jump Trading LLC, which was described as a legendary and secretive trading firm that's a major player in some of the most important financial markets. And there was a reason why Jump overpaid so much. It was an investment into guaranteeing future returns because ultimately the purchase was all about the location. Just across the street lies the data center for CME Group, the world's biggest futures exchange. And by placing its antennas so close to CME's servers, Jump hoped to shave maybe a microsecond off its reaction time, enough to separate a winning from a losing bid in trading that takes place at almost the speed of light. Enough to make billions in profits if done successfully, millions of times every minute of every year. As Bloomberg describes the land grab, it was the fastest and perhaps boldest salvo in an escalating war that's becoming waged to stay competitive in the high-speed trading business. At its core, the race is about latency arbitrage and not being the slowest firm on the block, which would be a recipe for financial ruin. Sending data back and forth between the US Midwest and East Coast allows high-frequency traders to profit from price differences for related assets, including the S&P 500 index futures in Illinois and stock prices in New Jersey. These arbitrage opportunities only last often tiny fractions of a second, which is ironic because at its core, modern high-frequency trade is about everything but a level playing field. After all, there are millions of traders to be front-running. Take that away, and the HFT parasites of the world would have no advantage whatsoever. Now, recently, it was announced that Royal Bank of Canada's Greg Mills, the global equities head who spearheaded the firm's fight against predatory high-frequency trading, is leaving RBC Capital Markets next month after two decades at the bank. According to Bloomberg, Mills was an advocate for market transparency while at RBC, and under his leadership, the firm developed a smart order router named Thor to level the playing field between institutional investors and high-frequency traders. The efforts earned the bank the moniker RBC Nice in Michael Lewis's 2014 book Flash Boys, A Wall Street Revolt. And what about Australia? Well, in 2014, ASIC released an interesting perspective on high-frequency trading. ASIC argued that whilst there are some similarities between the Australian and US markets, we do not have an HFT issue here. They say the order-to-trade ratio is lower in Australia at 8.1 compared with the US or EU, where it is above 30 And back in 2012, ASIC had established a task force to look at these concerns. The task force analysed data and market behaviour, and they said where appropriate, took action, including changes to the regulatory framework, and publicly reported on its findings. 
they said that while the United States and Australian markets do share some characteristics, more than one market trading the same securities, co-location and data feeds with different speeds, there are a number of factors that make the situation in Australia very different. Not only is the portion of the Australian market that is high frequency trades considerably smaller, but unlike the United States, ASIC has actively discouraged market taker pricing rebates, has banned payment for order flow, and has taken a principle-based approach to market selection for execution, i.e. there is no regulation national market system. ASIC said that their lack of hysteria regarding high frequency trading should not be mistaken for complacency. And ASIC has actively engaged with the evolution in the electronic marketplace, including high frequency trading, algorithms, and automated order processing. Now, a key element of a well-functioning market is price efficiency. This characterizes the extent to which asset prices reflect fundamental values. Dislocations of market prices are clear violations of price efficiency, as they happen in the absence of any news about fundamental values. But the point I want to make is this. First, I'm not convinced about the underlying assumption that more transactions gives greater market efficiency, and therefore HFT is just fine. Second, it appears that those without HFT lose out, so are second-class market participants. Those with more money to invest in market systems can make differentially more profit. This actually undermines the concept of a fair and open market, and we think therefore HFT needs to be better controlled to avoid an HFT arms race in search for ever swifter transaction times. And I'm not sure Australia is so insulated from HFT as ASIC then suggested. And in any case, we are part of an interconnected financial system. But the more specific point is that an ordinary investor or trader wishing to buy or sell stocks and shares, or derivatives for that matter, are on the opposite side of the transaction to the high-frequency traders. The market is effectively rigged. You will always lose. It is just not a level playing field. One argument, perhaps, as to why a financial transaction tax imposed on every trade would be a good thing, as it could potentially help to level the current tilted pitch. As always, if you like what you've seen here today, please like the post and add a comment or question. I do read them all. And if you want to join the growing band of subscribers who receive alerts when we release new posts, do subscribe now by hitting that subscribe bell. And if you've already subscribed, many thanks. I really appreciate your support and participation. I'm Martin North, the Principal Analyst of Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.